Hi everybody. My name is Wolfgang Schabach Neumann and I'm the president of Vintage Concert Audio. We are here in Frankfurt at Broleiten Sound. It's the first day at this fair and uh, we have brought some old equipment from the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, which I will show you, I'll give you a short overview. Over here, this is all stuff from the 60s, 70s. And uh, as you can see, the orange or the Marshall Master PA, if we go over here. The high watt and the sound city, for example, are basically modified guitar amplifiers with more channels. So you can put in the Marshall four microphones. The Orange takes six microphones, uh, the Hiwa two, as uh, six, and uh, the Sound City also six microphones. This is not much different from the guitar amplifier Sound City Hiwa Marshall and Orange uh, built in those times. They just had more inputs and I'm a guitar player and if I use this old 100 watt Marshall it sounds like an old guitar amp. So this is what they used for PA in the very beginnings. Speaker cabinets the same. These are all 12 and 10 inch equipped. Uh, this is a 4 by 10 and we have also, yeah, the Vox over here is a 4x12. It uses the same Celestian speakers that were used in those 4x12 Marshall boxes, just in a different format, just in a line array format. And it's, of course, sounds like a guitar speaker. So try at home, use your Marshall, and put the microphone in it and sing. Then you know how this sounds. <laughs> um, over here we have some very early, this is from the mid 60s from Dynacord, very very old stuff. This is what I had, what, I, what we used in my first band when I was a teen. We had one of those systems, this is just the Echo Unic, Echo Reverb maybe, a little bit. And this is a 4 channel mixing console with a 40 watt amplifier in it, tubes, all tubes. Later on, we come to some mixing devices which were more looking like a desk, like we used to have a sound desk today, but no faders available, only knobs. This WEM board, the Audio Master, was used by Pink Floyd, as you see here on the cover. You see on the van over here is the audio master, it's the Omagama from Pink Floyd. All right. So, very, very famous is the Shure Vocal Master. Shure did some PA systems. Many people don't know. In the 60s and 70s, Shure built PA systems. This is a vocal master which you find very much in 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 old uh, Stadthalle Offenbach. This one is from the Stadthalle in Offenbach. Yeah, and the cabinets over there on the outside, the big Schuhe cabinets, is also from Stadthalle Offenbach. Yeah. So they used two cabinets aside for a 3,000 people venue. The WEM stuff over here is very famous for gigs with Pink Floyd, So Who, everybody back in the old days used WEM as PA. was very, very famous PA back then. The custom stuff is coming from the US and uh, Credence Clearwater was using a lot of custom stuff and uh, the Osmonds were, I think, one of the bands who had a complete custom backline and PA back in the early 70s. Uh, later on, 70s, you see, 
We have the first boards with faders like we have today and uh, the sound shaping was a little bit difficult because you had only bass and treble, so no parametric, not a four band EQ. But those were the very beginnings. Yeah. Most of the old mixers were powered mixers. This means that the Dynacord has a 400 watt amplifier in it, two times 200. It also has a built-in crossover, which you only see on the back. You can buy amplifier cabinets and uh, very unique. It's a very good sounding board, made in Germany. Okay, so I think we should go over to the 70s. In the 70s we had the beginning of a new era with the Martin Audio modular system. This system for those days was groundbreaking. You have a bass, a mid cabinet, and a treble cabinet and a tweeter. You could run it four-way active. And if you have a lot of those stacks, I've seen Super Tramp here in the stadium in, in uh, Frankfurt in the end of the 70s. And they used a large Martin Audio system. And they did some stacking variants there, which had the base cabinets in one line, and then put one line of the mid-range cabinets, of the shavers, that's what they called, and then put the horns and tweeters. And it was like a line array we have today. And it was going all through the stadium with no delay lines, nothing, and the sound was perfect. Yeah, Czech Audio is a German manufacturer from near Hockenheim, the Mannheim area. This is the first cabinets Polo Czech, the guy who runs Czech, ran Czech Audio, has built ever. We got it from him as a present. Uh, he had them in his house. And he just called me one day and said, you want to have it? And I said, yeah, of course I want to have it. So this is the very first base cabinet he ever built in his life. The next one is a Serve in Vega PA, which was quite popular in the 80s. I saw Cameo Word Up Tour with five stacks aside for 3,000 people, which was not much PA, but was enough and sounded great. The other box here is an Emptown box. It's made in Germany, Hamburg, Emptown. It's, uh, I think they now build cases, but they did build uh, PA systems in the early, in the 70s and 80s. The world famous Bose. I mean, Everybody has heard a Bose cabinet. It's not bad, but it's not nothing for a big show. But if you have like four aside and a subwoofer, you can get pretty much good sound out of it. Eliminators and Sentry 4 was, I think, the Eliminator was a, a box I saw in Germany many, many times with smaller bands. They had three to four aside. The Rodka Monotones used it many, many years <laughs> and did many, many shows with it. And the Sentry 4 was just a bigger version, better version, which came out later. Bose also did their own amplifiers, which were pretty cool, but very heavy back in these days. The famous Martin Audio Wedges. One of my favorites, those were the best stage monitors you could use. They always sounded great, no matter how big the stage was, they were loud enough somehow. And uh, when I saw these wedges on stage, I always had the feeling we, had, we don't have a problem today <laughs> with the band not hearing themselves. 
The JBL is a copper red series wedge, which is uh, just featuring a 12 inch speaker and a bullet tweeter. Sounds very nice, but it's not f as loud as a Martin audio wedge. So this is a rock and roll wedge. This is more for theater work. All right, I think we got it here. We go over to the other side, to the 80s. Yeah, come buy, buy a t-shirt. <laughs> All right, here we go. Meyer Sound, Meyer Sound MSL3s. Meyer Sound was one of the first, I mean, I think he was, he was the first with the processor coming out and uh, easy to use PA. You didn't have to choose crossover points or something like that. Crossover, EQ, and compressors are all built in a unit called Processor. And they choose matched amplifiers that match the system and the output. I used those, like 14 aside plus subs for Saga in the beginning of the 90s in Denmark. I don't remember the name of the PA company because I was Saga's engineer from the house. And I must say, this was the best sounding PA system for Saga I ever heard. <laughs> it's a great system. It was very expensive back in these days. The first time I heard this system was four stacks aside at Stadthalle Offenbach with Ultravox. And this was because a friend of mine was the tour manager here in Germany and he just called me in the afternoon and said, you got to come over to Stadthalle Offenbach right now because they have one of those new PA systems. It doesn't have a crossover. It's so loud, so clean, so good. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but this night I got introduced to their crew and uh, had the chance to talk to them and found out about Meyer Sound, which was innovative stuff back then, early 80s, really innovative. Again, the German manufacturer Shake Audio, very popular here in Germany. In the 80s was the Blue Horn, which features a 12-inch speaker and a 1-inch driver. And the original bass cabinet was double 12 ATC speakers. Very good bass cabinet, but was expensive. Many people used different bass cabinets under this blue thing. And uh, very good for this is very efficient. You had a 200 or 300 watt amplifier and two of the blue boxes on it and you could do like five, 600 people. Dean B, the sound pioneers from Germany. <laughs> this is one of the best examples how compact a good PA can get. I mean, I when I saw this the first time, when I used this, I had two of those double 15 inch subs aside and one of those tops. And it was a show for like 1,200 to 1,500 people. And I came in the venue and I said, OK, these are the side fields. Where's the PIA? And the guy said, no, no, it's a, it's a good system. It's D&B audio and you never heard about it. I said, I heard about it, but it's only one, one top per side. It's, it's not going to work, man. After sound check, I changed my opinion. And we had a great show. <laughs> so this is one of the first German systems that used a control unit. This means this is the amplifier, all the processing, including frequency dividing network, everything, compression, is in this box. And as you can see, this has just one knob, power on, off, on, and volume. That's it. 
And this made it really easy to use because you, you don't have to spend much time with tuning the system so not the volume with the bass and the mid, you don't have to adjust this. This was all done by DNB Audio Technic in the box, so you plug it in. It was plug and play. Yeah. Lovely box, still sounding great. If you use it, you can hear it. We, in one hour we have a acoustic, I said the 110 dB round, they crank it up and you'll hear it's good, good stuff. Here's the DNP stuff without the foam in front. Yeah. Smaller box from DNP, the 1220. Same, same thing. Processor amplifier, everything in it. The first series had TAD drivers and they sounded like studio monitors. It's still one of the best sounding 12 inch two way box on the market. Really good stuff. All right, so yeah, Bose, the newer version of the Bose and the double 12 inch base cabinet for more Fund. All righty, right. If we go over here on the left side, on the far left. Oh no, this this is where we where we stop. We start in the middle. <laughs> Again, DNB DNB is our sponsor this year at the show, and they help us a lot in realizing what we do because this kills it kills a lot of private money here. <laughs> um, The C-series from DNB, very famous here in Germany, very good PA for the time. And uh, same thing, controller amplifiers, easy to use, small truck package thing, which you can use for smaller clubs. I did one open air where we had like 20 of those aside which was really sounding great. This is a long throw version of it, I believe. It's good. I, I believe it's double 10 and more like a line array thing over here. Yeah. Then we have the Epochi artist. Epochi sound from the States. They had the artist series, which was a little bit more affordable to musicians. And this is one good example of it. It's a double 15 inch, a 10 inch and a 1 inch. And it's two way active. It's got a processor with it, but you can choose your own amplifiers. And it was really affordable PA. If you have two aside, you didn't need subs. And uh, it sounded pretty cool. I still remember mixing on it. EAW KF850, which is one of the was one of the touring standards in the 90s. The Maya Sound MSL4, smaller size cabinets than the MSL3s over there but same output, I believe, or not, not so far away. Pretty cool PA system. Next one is Electro Voice MT4s. I heard those with AC-DC, and you, you wouldn't believe how loud these can get. Really loud. This is one of the loudest PAs in the world. Pretty heavy, I think it's about 200 kilograms the top cabinet, nearly. Yeah, yeah. The first line array. <laughs> I mean, the first line array that you could use for concert sound. Line arrays were not new when Christian Heil presented this to the touring world, but uh, he was the first guy to put this in a 
format that you can use it on tour and put it for, for big concerts. And uh, this was long time the touring standard worldwide. All right. I think we're done with the boxes. Shall we go over to the con consoles? All right. So, German Rock Palast, fond of house over here, supplied by Crystal Sound for many, many years here in Germany for every Rock Palast show. It's a Harrison HM4. It's a very, very, very nice sounding console. And this one was bought, I believe, late 80s. Late 80s, beginning of the 90s. I don't remember exactly. Um, standard effect racks using using all that stuff that you know. It's like PCM series, lexicon reverbs, TC electronic delays, even tight harmonizer. SPX from Yamaha and of course DBX 160A everyone in the 80s had DBX 160s in his rack though this was the standard compressor in those days let's go over here we have also the monitor console from Rock Palist. What you see here is a Midas 32 channel PR04 console. Just 10 monitor ways, that was it, and 32 input channels. And I guess all of the bands used this PA. There's old pictures of Huptus, Huptus surround here. Um, during the setup, <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Those were the days, yeah, yeah. Ah, it's also not bad, yeah. Yeah, um, this is. The PA from Rock Palace they used. It's the original system from Crystal Sound with the original lamp racks they used. And the original drive rack. This is a lot of history. And there you see U2, the Steve Miller Band, Joe Cocker, Stray Cats, Dave Edmonds use that systems. This is a Sutton PA. Sutton is made in UK and it's really rare. I think there was only two or three systems over here in Germany I heard about and the largest uh, system was at Crystal Sound. I in person used it because I worked a lot for Crystal Sound uh, being a FOH babysitter in the in the 90s and uh, we did some really big open air concerts with this system and it sounded pretty pretty nice very high resolution system for those days very good components yeah cool to work with yeah i mean outboard equipment whatever you want it's there Lexicon Super Prime Time. I I never could afford one when I was a young mixing guy, but I had this in my rack, the pitch transposer, which is a harmonizer and works pretty well. And uh, but but this this he couldn't afford. This was so expensive. Even so, the the space station, this was not in reach, not at all. Yeah. No chance to buy one. <laughs> but this is pretty much standard stuff. 
with PCM 70s, which was the first affordable reverb. First affordable, good reverb, I mean. Uh, and uh, lots of old gear here. Roland Chorus Echo, which is a tape echo unit. And uh, yeah. Very old stuff. Old Dynacot PA, DRP16 is, uh, oh, it's not working. Um, one of the first digital reverbs that had a pre-delay in it. I guess it was their first model. The other one was the Yamaha R1000, which is not here, I believe. I think we have one. Not sure in which rack. It's not easy if you have so much equipment. <laughs> Smaller desks here. Mitek is a German manufacturer. The PV monitor desk was used by the Rotgau Monotones, one of the most famous bands <laughs> out of the Rotgau. <laughs> Close friends of mine. And um, this is how they started. This was their first monitor board they could afford. And I think this was used on, on all the festival gigs and all shows they did to put their own monitor board. And it still works. It's still there. An old Soundcraft Series 1S. The first one with parametric. Really cool board. And affordable in these days, but only 16 inputs. So this was the beginning of the 80s, and uh, yeah, 60, 16 channels was a lot then. Today it's nothing. Today 16 channels is a drum. Let's go over to the big, big guys here. Start over here. Midas. My favorite consoles in the 80s and in the 90s. This is a Midas. This is a Midas I used for Saga in 90 and 91. I had this board from a German company called Rock Sound. They did Saga these days and they called me, you want to mix Saga? I said, yes, I want to do this. And then I was the front of house engineer for two years. Um, this is pretty much was the touring standard for many, many years because it was simple to operate and easy to get a great sound out of it. Very fast because of these modules. You only had a three band parametric with switches, switched microphone, uh, uh, 6 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, and the bass was like 120 or 60. So you were really fast with it. And many people may say, yeah, but I want to choose the frequency. And this is not exact enough. This EQ sounded better than this one, in my opinion. And. Uh, when we had one of those boards, I don't I didn't need a sound check with with the band. I just go like, here's my gain, here's this, we, and then push the fader up, and it was there. <laughs> As you see, there's many, many, many Midas. It's a complete line Midas. This is a old Dire Straits monitor board which was owned by Concert Sound. Uh, the option here is not, uh, this, is, this is an option. It's got four more auxiliaries. You have 12 mixes normally and with this part you have 16. But this was an option, you had to order it. But I think I never seen a Midas twice. They're all custom-made consoles. So everybody was telling them I need four more auxes, the other one wants a switch here. Different and they all, they did it. <laughs> they were all custom-made. Yeah? Not like today if you order 
a board which is the same like your competitor on the other side of the street has. Another Midas, this is one of the features I liked the most. This shows your input gain. This means if you if you have a festival, you see immediately on which channel I have an input. And uh, this is a great feature, I love this, because the guys on stage say we're checking bass drum and then it's coming on channel 17, you could say no, you have the wrong patch. <laughs> you have to resync it. Cool boards. A newer Midas. They were, they were coming out in the early 90s. I remember one tour with Saga where we had to switch boards. I had one of my loved old ones, PR series, and then one of the guys from Rock Sound called me and said, we have to change boards because we have a tour starting where we need the other board. And they gave me one of those, which was brand new then, and brand new on the market, I mean. Um, and sent me one of those, and th this was really like, I looked at it and said, this is not a Midas, it's lo it looks so different to, to this one. But it sounded pretty, pretty cool, and I was very, very happy to have the board. Very good one. The XL3 was like touring standard, And one of the first boards you could use at front of house and monitors. You have 16 mixes, you have VCAs, you have mix groups, you have everything on this board. This was many, many years the touring standard until this one came out. The only thing I don't like on a Midas XL4 is the weight. The rest is like, it's one of the best sounding boards in the world. Every time I toured with one of those, I had fun. Many, many years, again, the touring standard. Many years, Midas was the leading console company. All right. Over here, we have another Midas, and this is a good example. Like, like you seen the other boards, this one is completely different. Somebody, I guess these are peak power meters, peak meters, somehow different meters. Somebody specified this. This is from uh, a console, from a house console from ICC in Berlin, a conference center. The TAC Super Console did the hit parade many, many years. Dieter Thomas Heck. And uh, very, very nice console, which is, uh, yeah, as the name says, Super Console. Do you have for everything a switch? Yeah. It's, it's a lot of auxiliaries here. EQ section, everything very, very cool. Too many knobs. <laughs> Soundcraft 8000 was a budget desk for those who could not afford a Midas. They bought the Soundcraft 8000. They were pretty cool, they're very good sounding boards, but they were a little noisy. But in the old days, nobody cared. If you push up the fader and the PA goes like, Sss, you knew it was on. The Ramsa SX1. I only saw this board. You can both do. You can put it on front of house, and you can put it in the monitor. But 
for the features, this was a very uh, uh, well-priced uh, console, I would say. And everybody used it as a monitor console. I never, I never saw one on front of house. But you could use it as a front of house. It got many, many knobs, many, many auxiliary sends, big EQ section, VCAs, audio groups, whatever you want, it's in there. This is what I believe is the biggest soundcraft board ever built. The Soundcraft Europa. I don't know a bigger board from the frame size. And uh, here's, every channel has a noise gate. That's very unique in this board. The rest is pretty much standard Soundcraft support you could use immediately. You don't have to think about it. Every knob is where you expect it to be. Yeah. And of course, also a lot of auxiliaries. Yeah. The Crest. The Crest was a budget, budget series desk, which was very reliable. But you found these many, many times as a monitor board in, in smaller clubs or as a house console. They sounded good. Uh, it's not, not, not compared to a Midas, but they sounded good. That was okay. And they were very affordable. That's why people bought them. Yeah. All right. Let's go over to the other side. So that first one over here is the English English console. As we had the, the Suton PA on the other side, this is same manufacturer. And uh, very strange thing is that they had the auxiliary here the gain and this is going in 10 dB steps so uh, if you find out you don't have enough gain you had to low down the fader on the festival and then had 10 dBs more if you switch if you didn't lower the fader and forgot about this you really could push a solo with this <laughs> But good sounding board. PM1000, Yamaha, looks like new. Very reliable, everything Yamaha builds is very, very reliable. Until today, I never had problems on tour with the Yamaha board, never. So these old ones, the PM1000 and the PM2000, you see over there, which is the bigger brother, and it was the next in line. Good sounding boards. The PM2000 comes out of the Philips Halle in Düsseldorf. They used it as a house board. And uh, those were those, the, the, the 2000 series was, this one is early 80s. Yeah. This one is early 80s. And uh, I heard somebody telling me this is the poor man's Neve. And, and you know, Neve is very good sounding product. This is a very good sounding board and very, very reliable. It still works. It's from the early 80s and you switch it on and it works. Wow. Respect. The newer ones, this is a PM1800. This is a PM3000 and the PM4000. This is, as you, as you can see on the colors and the knobs, this is a family. This one came out first and this one came this was very long time the touring standard. Even American top acts came with this board. And I asked the guy that mixed Tina Turner 
and he said I'm using this because it's so reliable and be going around the world I don't want to fight with repairing the board because I asked him why he's not using a Harrison board because I owned the HM5 and it was like you had to repair it all day long and he said no I'm using a Yamaha because you never have traveled with it and yeah I mean this guy was traveling the world it was Dave Natal and uh, he was right, because I heard the gig when he mixed Tina Turner, and I must say this was one of the best live sounds I ever experienced in my life. And he was using a PM4000 and two SPXs. That was it. The first digital. This is a breakthrough. This is a milestone. This came out early 2000s, I believe 2001 we got delivery of the first two PM1Ds when they were new, brand new. We were the first ones in Germany that got delivered of it because we had a tour upcoming and we put it on tour and we had no complaints, nothing like, oh, I cannot work with this board because uh, some problems, nothing. Yamaha delivers you a digital board and it works. You can go on tour. And uh, I experienced different with other manufacturers <laughs> later. <laughs> but PM1D was a working horse. We used them for many, many years. And uh, we still have, we now have Three of it in our museum. Yeah. Three plus, plus the output equipment. And uh, I must say, they're still working. You switch it on after all those years and they're still doing good. And they still sound good. So, there's nothing wrong with the PM1D. All right. I believe we're finished, Markus. Thank you.